But the daily White House briefings are back. And on Wednesday alone, there were briefings not only at the White House, but State Department, Pentagon, a virtual briefing by the Coronavirus Task Force, officials taking questions and answering them from reporters, not walking away after some kind of brief statement or temper tantrum, or tweeting out short bursts of information, or just not bothering to show up at all. The briefing is back. One key Biden administration official answering questions on Wednesday was the freshly sworn in Secretary of State Anthony Blinken. He talked about some of the biggest foreign policy challenges like arms sales to Saudi Arabia, a potential new agreement with Iran and the relationship with China. I think it's, it's not a secret that um, the relationship between the United States and China is uh, arguably the most important relationship uh, that we have uh, in the world going, going forward. Uh, it's going to shape a lot of the future that, uh, that we all live. And uh, increasingly, uh, that relationship uh, has some adversarial aspects to it. CNN's Ivan Watson standing by live in Hong Kong with more on the adversarial aspects that are affecting China's neighbours as well. Ivan. Yeah, and John, worth noting that he went on to say that there were also cooperative and uh, competitive aspects to this relationship. But for sure, uh, the tensions in the region are higher. Uh, there does seem to be a feeling out period going on between Beijing and the new Biden administration after the acrimony and the, just the sheer hostility that uh, was underway between Beijing and the outgoing Trump administration, which got slapped with sanctions as Joe Biden was being inaugurated and sworn into office. But as far as the adversarial side of this, uh, you see that reflected in the posture, for example, of the U.S. military here in Asia. This is a sneak attack. A war game beneath the iconic heights of Japan's Mount Fuji, where the U.S. military practices landing small teams of Marines deep behind enemy lines. The scenario imagines they're raiding an island in Asia and blowing up missile launchers that threaten U.S. warships. What we're training for specifically here is a, a peer or near peer competitor who has advanced weapon systems, who has the ability to conduct targeting via satellites. After nearly 20 years battling insurgents in Central Asia and the Middle East, the U.S. military is training to fight a much more sophisticated enemy in Asia. Is Asia in the midst of a power struggle right now? Yes. The short answer is yes. This is now the center of gravity for influence in global economics and politics. China is seeking to be a dominant power, almost an imperial power, and many countries in this region don't want to see this dominance happen. One of the biggest international challenges facing President Biden is a relationship with China that grew increasingly hostile under the Trump administration. President Trump was right in taking uh, a tougher approach to China. Uh, I disagree very much with uh, the way that he went about it in a number of areas, but the basic principle was the right one. In a speech to the World Economic Forum this week, China's leader called for more cooperation, not conflict. The misguided approach of antagonism and confrontation, be it in the form of Cold War, Hot War, Trade War, or Tech War, would eventually harm every nation's interests and sacrifice people's welfare. But China under Xi Jinping has been quick to flex its military and economic muscles. Your surrender! Surrender! Using its growing power to intimidate neighbors, says Richard Heydarian, a political scientist and author from the Philippines. I mean, China is at loggerheads with practically all major neighbors with the exception of Russia, right? And I think that says a lot about how China is also mishandling its foreign policy and its relations with other countries. Look at these points of tension. Taiwan, where the island's military has scrambled to meet increasingly frequent overflights from Chinese warplanes. The Himalayas, where Chinese and Indian troops have been fighting deadly border skirmishes. The South China Sea, where the U.S. and other navies have stepped up their own naval maneuvers around China's man-made islands, which are part of Beijing's strategy to claim virtually all of the sea for itself.
and the East China Sea, where warplanes and warships jockey around islands claimed by both Japan and China. All potential flashpoints in this regional power struggle. The competition in Asia also involves trade, technology, and even public health. The world is watching to see how Biden confronts this complicated 21st century contest. So, John, part of Trump's legacy here in Asia that he's leaving Biden is this much more confrontational approach to China uh, with the accusations that China uses its economic might uh, to punish other countries when it doesn't like what they're doing politically. Uh, but clearly, the Trump administration's erraticism, the, the, the fact that it was so unpredictable, it pushed smaller countries here in the region to, to recognize, uh, many political scientists here say, that they kind of have to take their own defense more into their own hands. That compounded with what many countries here perceived as China's much more aggressive posture here has resulted in something really interesting, where countries like India and Australia and Vietnam and Japan have all been getting closer together with their own bilateral and trilateral agreements and, and defense cooperation. And then the Quad uh, has gotten more active. That's the, the Australian, Indian, Japanese, U.S. kind of loose conglomeration. A uh, real question will be, will Biden follow through on his pledge to continue challenging China, uh, but also to shore up the U.S.'s alliances here in Asia. And as we all know, Biden already has some very serious challenges to deal with on the home front, probably first. John? Just a few. Ivan, thank you. Ivan Watson, life for us there in Hong Kong. Well, on the Iran nuclear treaty, the new Biden administration says the U.S. will consider rejoining the international agreement once Tehran is in compliance. If Iran comes back into full compliance with its obligations under the JCPOA, uh, the United States uh, would do the same thing. Uh, and then we would use that uh, as a platform uh, to build with our allies and partners uh, what we call a longer uh, and stronger agreement and to deal with a number of other issues that are deeply problematic in uh, the relationship uh, with Iran. Uh, but we are uh, a long ways uh, from that point. A day before Blinken's remarks, Iran threatened to block short notice inspections of its nuclear facilities. Tehran is demanding an end to U.S. economic sanctions before rejoining the nuclear deal. Well, the Biden administration has paused a pending arms sale to Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates while it reviews the agreements. The reviews are typical for a new administration, but could also signal a change in policy. At the end of last year, the Trump White House pushed through a number of arms sales to Riyadh and Abu Dhabi, including 50...